Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also very much, uh, Thiers, uh, Irene, uh, for your introduction. Um, I think it gave a very good horizontal uh, overview of the work done so far. Uh, I very much appreciate, uh, and in particular in these days, that we can continue uh, our own ongoing uh, dialogue, uh, because these are issues that are important and will affect uh, citizens uh, all over uh, the Union. Uh, it has, uh, the, the pandemic has caused a lot of uh, change, but also a lot of suffering. Uh, in the most hard-hit uh, member states, of course, many, many people have lost their lives, uh, families have lost their loved ones. And uh, also in, in the lockdown, you see that for, for many people, the social consequences, they are uh, immense. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is very important uh, that now uh, we still have sort of this uh, eye for the present, uh, while, of course, not only rebuilding, but also renewing our societies uh, and our economies uh, in the, the weeks and months uh, to come with the perspective of uh, our green transition uh, and the digital transition as well. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, the Commission will present uh, a proposal for a recovery uh, package. Uh, President Ursula von der Leyen has already uh, outlined the architecture uh, for you uh, in the European uh, Parliament in the last uh, plenary session. And we are now finalizing the package uh, to be able to present it uh, to you now in, in just uh, two days. And we need a European recovery plan that is both uh, green and digital, so that we still you know, go for our uh, strategic uh, goals. Uh, the European Parliament will have an essential role to play uh, because uh, it is important that this package work for all Europeans. Uh, the European uh, Parliament uh, will have the same say on how the recovery uh, money is spent as you have on the European budget, uh, the MFF. Uh, one of our initiatives that I would like to mention uh, to you today is the new uh, solvency uh, instrument. Uh, this will help uh, match uh, recapitalization needs of otherwise healthy companies that has been put at risk uh, because of the lockdown. Uh, and this will be targeted for member states uh, most in need. Uh, of course, I'm looking forward to come back uh, to discuss with you in, in great uh, detail uh, also what it is that we will present uh, Wednesday. Uh, as we are now, uh, I think it is, it is very important uh, to see that some of our basic uh, assets, they will serve as well uh, also uh, in recovering. And here, of course, I think of the single market. Uh, it is a major com uh, contributor to, to growth, to employment, uh, to competitiveness. And uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, has only confirmed how important it is to maintain it. Uh, and the single market will maintain, and, and still it is uh, the main driver uh, also of the recovery, because our prosperity uh, comes from the fact that we trade with one another and that we are woven together in, in value change uh, between uh, countries. So the main thing here is, of course, that this will only happen if we have an unfragmented uh, single market so we really should uh, enforce uh, the rules that you as a legislator uh, has decided uh, to make sure that the single market does not fragment. Uh, and this is why we've been working to strengthen the resilience of our economy, uh, including tackling the harmful and protectionist restrictions that has been put in place with some member states. Also, uh, the single market uh, task force have had its first meeting. Uh, and of course, we really want to push this uh, because it is important for every member state, for every business, for every employee that the single market is working. On the state aid rules that you chair uh, went uh, through, uh, this of course has a, a very important, uh, crucial role in supporting uh, businesses in this, in this unprecedented uh, crisis. Uh, we have worked very closely with member states to approve 175 national measures uh, to date. Uh, 
uh, and that is from the beginning of March uh, till today, 175 uh, decisions. Uh, as was said, we adopted the temporary framework in March, and that enables member states uh, to have uh, the full flexibility foreseen under state aid rules to provide liquidity uh, and support to the uh, economy. Um, the temporary framework has, after this, twice been amended, uh, reflecting the evolution of, uh, of needs of businesses. Uh, overall, it ensures that public support is limited in time and targeted only to the problems uh, that companies are currently facing. Uh, liquidity support can be granted till the end of 2020 to help companies overcome liquidity shortages, uh, to prevent uh, layoffs and to encourage uh, research and development, uh, testing and mass production of COVID-19 uh, relevant uh, products. But the temporary framework also uh, facilitates liquidity support through subordinated debts. Uh, as the crisis evolves, uh, many businesses will need capital uh, to stay afloat. Uh, if member states uh, provide such support, uh, the temporary uh, framework ensures that support comes with strings attached, including a ban on dividends, bonus payments, and that taxpayers are sufficiently remunerated for the risk that they are taken. Uh, and when large sums of taxpayer money is used, well, we need transparency. Uh, and this is why large companies will have to report on the use of aid received and how they will comply with their responsibility linked to the green and, and digital uh, transition. Uh, as of now, uh, the state aid uh, committed by member state in schemes and of individual measures represents around 2 trillion uh, euros. Uh, this is an enormous amount of public money. Uh, there are, however, uh, large differences uh, in the amounts granted by member states, and this reflects uh, not only the size of member states, but also the differences in fiscal uh, space available uh, to the different uh, member states. And I think it's important to be mindful of these uh, differences. Uh, and looking ahead, uh, that is why we need a multi-annual financial framework and the solvency instrument I mentioned uh, earlier uh, to ensure that this symmetric crisis do not become an asymmetric shock to the detriment of, of member states uh, with less possibilities to help their businesses and where we would lose cohesion that we have built for, for decades. A few words about the impact uh, also on, of COVID-19 on antitrust uh, and uh, merger control here in the end. Um, the crisis and especially the risk of shortages of uh, supply of essential goods and services has triggered the need for companies in certain sectors to cooperate beyond what they normally uh, would do. That be uh, in, in particular in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, antitrust rules should not stand in the way of uh, an efficient and, and justified uh, response to specific and exceptional uh, situations. Uh, but, of course, and I would like to make that perfectly clear, uh, companies should, of course, not take any advantage of this crisis by cartelizing uh, the market or abusing a dominant position. Uh, so on the 8th of uh, April, uh, the Commission adopted the temporary framework for assessing uh, antitrust issues under the crisis. Uh, and this communication sets out the main criteria to be followed uh, when businesses engage in cooperation projects. It also foresees the possibilities of um, issue written sort of ad hoc uh, comfort letters uh, on specific uh, cooperation projects. Uh, falling within the scope uh, of this uh, set of rules. Uh, one such letter was adopted uh, on the same uh, day, and that provided comfort on the voluntary uh, cooperation project between pharmaceutical uh, producers to tackle shortages of crucial um, uh, hospital medicines uh, for the treatment of COVID-19 patients, and that was then in compliance with antitrust rules in views of what, what did they wanted to achieve and the different safeguards uh, that was put in place. On merger control, 
Uh, we continue to receive uh, filings and processes uh, cases as usual uh, to ensure, of course, a smooth uh, process under new uh, remote uh, working conditions for both the merging parties uh, and the Commission. Uh, and, of course, with the usual uh, merger deadlines, uh, the Commission has issued guidance uh, for firms on how to best to notify uh, on proposed uh, transactions. Uh, the challenges linked uh, to conducting a uh, prospective assessment in merger of investigations are, of course, multiplied uh, in this unusual uh, circumstance. Uh, but we continue to assess uh, each case on its merits. And, of course, we take into account uh, the specificities of, of the relevant uh, sectors. Uh, just to conclude, uh, work is ongoing. Uh, it has been as busy as ever. Uh, as you know, we were supposed to discuss the report on competition policy by Stephanie Yoncoton uh, during the March uh, plenary. Uh, the pandemic changed our plans, uh, but I hope that we will have the uh, occasion for such a plenary debate uh, soon again. Uh, the report showed very clearly uh, the Parliament's interest, uh, engagement in competition policy, its support for strong competition uh, law enforcement, and also the importance of this policy area for our economy. And that remains true now more than ever. Um, although we have made changes as to how we work, uh, setting up uh, temporary frameworks uh, for our enforcement, we have not done, and we should not do, uh, suspend competition rules. Uh, we need those rules going forward, uh, and we need uh, the vigorous uh, enforcement to make our economy stronger and to support uh, broad growth uh, and innovation. And I look very much forward to discuss this and, and other topics with you. So thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 